okay. I think um, we could uh, start. It's uh, one minute past uh, nine o'clock, so um, I think people will just uh, jump in as we uh, go along. But um, I uh, want to, on behalf of the force and the organizing committee, I want to welcome everyone to this um, Underexplore Place webinar. It's um, a pleasure that we could uh, host this uh, this as a webinar, it's uh, of course uh, want to have a physical one, but um, it was not possible this time. And um, but I think that uh, seeing that uh, more than almost twice as many people as we could have a physical conference in the in Stavanger in the Valhall uh, conference room means that it's uh, also maybe um, good to have as a webinar, so we could include uh, so many people. So um, my name is Matthias Stalvenberg. I'm working in Lundin. I'm a chairman of this organizing committee and uh, together with me in the in the committee I have Cecilia Hjort from Spirit Energy, Hans Martin Weding from uh, NPD, Rory Salmon from Equinor, Heather Bailey from OMV and Alan Jarsve from Pandion Energy and uh, Eirik Aven from ConocoPhillips. Also want to give a huge thank to to Linz Mayer in, in NPD and the force for for organizing this uh, for us. Um, so uh, it's um, I will um, go into to sharing a presentation now, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll uh, see it. Uh, so if not, please uh, call out from the organizing committee. So um, um, before we go into to the to the the seminar itself, I just want to have a um, quick security notice. Uh, so please, no screenshots allowed. We are will record as you see the presentations. Uh, some presentations will not be recorded and not shared afterwards. So, uh, so we will have the chance to uh, get a, a lot of the presentations that you see today and tomorrow. But um, it's uh, it's you need to respect that some presenters will not share their presentation after the the conference. So, so please no no screenshots allowed. And um, as you see here, you see um, the the painting is used as a background for the, the conference, the um, Life Ericsson Discovering America by Christian Krog, 1893. And uh, Life Ericsson was a, a man that uh, he was born at Iceland. He, um, he lived at Greenland and he uh, went to Norway. And uh, on his way back from, from Norway on the West Coast, he was going back to Greenland and he ended up in, in North America. So someone can say that it was an accident that he ended up in North America around 1000 years ago. Um, and uh, someone says that this was uh, actually a planned expedition. And this was 500 years before Christopher Columbus uh, discovered America uh, in that sense. So, um, but if it was a planned expedition uh, or anyway, he must have been a true explorer and going out there for the unknown uh, searching for for something uh, to be discovered, a uh, significant discovery. And um, many of you have probably seen this this painting before uh, by by Christian Krog, but uh, but you probably not only seen it at National Museum or or other um, other um, copies of, of this painting, but you may be seen this before as well on on conferences being presented by Hans Christian Rønnevik, who who passed away last year. He was the former exploration manager of, of Lundin Energy Norway. And um, among other things, he has known for the discovery of the Avalsnes uh, uh, discovery, the known and now as the Johan Sverdrup field, but of course other great significant discoveries on the Norwegian continental shelf. So he was a great, great pioneer and, and going out there and, and exploring for, for oil and gas and, and very important contributor to the Norwegian oil and gas industry. And um, he often used this uh, painting of, of Leif Eriksson describing uh, exploration, but he also described it as uh, part of the leadership where when you are exploring for oil and gas. So not only going out there and explore, but going out there and, and lead your, your crew uh, from the deck. And Hans Christian often did, he was sitting in, in the open landscape and doing seismic interpretation, mapping out prospects together with his crew. And when Johan Sverdrup of Avalsnes was discovered. It was uh, published an article saying that the astonishing thing about this discovery is that it has lain undiscovered in a mature oil province for so long, providing ample encouragement for explorers to go on exploring. 
I think that's in this kind of climate today when we're talking about most companies are talking about near field exploration. It still shows you that near field doesn't need to be boring, but it still can be very excited, underexplored, and there are a lot of opportunities. And this is the uh, NPD um, prognosis for the oil production on Norwegian continental shelf that they released 2009, right uh, at the moment when Johan Sverdrup or Avalsnes uh, was discovered. And you can see the chart here showing the oil production from 1970 and until 2040. So they show the history uh, production and the prognosis for the future. You can see it was a rapid decline after 2004 and that it will still decline uh, until 2040, but with the help of Johan Sverdrup, you would increase the production. So of course we know that Johan Sverdrup was a great contribution uh, to the production on the shelf and of course to the society itself. But the history can be, be quite certain and, and the, the future could be uh, very, very uncertain. And we see that with uh, both the pandemic, but also the energy prices we see today and the, the oil prices. Uh, and taking us back to the history, we can go thousand years back uh, again to Leif Eriksson and his uh, voyages from, from Norway to, to Iceland, to Greenland, and then finally ends up in, in North America. And you see where he traveled from the west coast of Norway. He he passed and sailed across a lot of our exploration licenses in the northern part of the North Sea. He actually passed a very, very prolific oil province. And uh, I can imagine that when he traveled from the West Coast and he passed these prolific oil provinces, he was thinking about the uh, underexplored lands that were lying in front of him. Some great sig uh, significant discoveries being made for, for uh, him and his crew. But, but also maybe he was thinking about what was lying below him uh, under the sea. And maybe when he passed the Snowden and Stadtfjord, he saw some gas bubbles coming up from the underground. And uh, maybe he urged his crew to sail even faster to avoid the Midgard serpent coming up from the below or the Midgard Oymen as we know in, in Norwegian. Um, when you zoom into that map and we see that he, he sailed from around Bergen and he crossed the Troll and Greater Fram area, and the Greater Fram area we will hear more about in, in, in this seminar. And then he ended uh, past the Stadtfjord and Snorri area. If you zoom even further, we can see that he passed a very interesting area. And he actually passed uh, right above the Top An discovery, the spud location of the Top An, who was announced um, in, in, in this year. Uh, significant um, and world-class discovery according to, to Equinor, and uh, it's the first time, uh, according to Equinor, to use the 4D seismic uh, in exploration, showing the, the improvement to data and, uh, and using new technology, or not maybe new, but, but using the technology to make, make discoveries. And the top on prospect and discovery itself is, is not a globally significant discovery, but the great um, exploration success with Equinor and partners in the FRAM area has shown that you can make smaller discoveries and many of those and some of them then will be very very significant and of course it's close to infrastructure so it will be a very very important uh, discovery to to uh, develop and um, and we will hear of course as i said more about the greater from area in, in in the seminar and other near field opportunities that's uh, that's uh, have been discovered and, and still there uh, to be be searched for and of course, when Life Eriksson traveled, he, he couldn't uh, discover Top End because he had this kind of ship when he, he went out there with his crew. I guess that uh, maybe they would uh, drill it because uh, his crew seems to be quite risky going out with its kind of boat and sail all the way to North America. So they are like uh, us in, in the exploration uh, community, uh, quite risky, uh, dealing with risk every day in our daily work. But uh, unfortunately, Life Eriksson didn't have the opportunity to drill. But thousand years later, he finally got his own ship to, to drill. So with the drilling rig, uh, Life Eriksson by Transocean, he actually made uh, some significant discoveries and drilled a lot of wells on the Norwegian continental shelf. And in late 2020, actually Life Eriksson did a significant oil discovery with ConocoPhillips in the Schlagugle uh, discovery in the Norwegian sea. Um, the size of the discovery is between 75 to 20 million barrels of recoverable oil. And that's quite significant in this mature area. It's also very important to mention that this uh, Schlagugle discovery and the prospect have been licensed many, many times before. 
It was first uh, awarded in the 15 licensing round in 1996. And all the names of those companies doesn't exist anymore at the Norwegian continental shelf. So names, they changes, they merges, they, they disappear. Uh, but of course, the geology is still there and always there. And, and therefore, you had this uh, APA 2005 award again in 2009. And then last in 2016, award to Conoco Phillips and Pandion that drilled the, the prospect and finally then made the discovery. I also think it's interesting to see that um, it was an international giant that finally drilled the prospect and not a newcomer on the shelf, a giant that has been here from the very first time. And um, that also shows the importance of, of having APA and data improvements and that we recycle these licenses. Going back again to Hans Christian Rennevik, who was awarded because his contribution to the Norwegian continental shelf and the oil industry, and of course all the wealth created for the Norwegian society. He was awarded uh, and knighted by the King of Norway, and um, you can actually see from, from the press release, release when he, he was awarded uh, uh, and, and knighted, he, um, he actually, if you look at his computer here, and this is uh, quite random uh, when I, I found this picture, but, but you actually see that he was actually also looking into the Skari area of the Schlag Ugle where we drilled. And that shows that uh, a man like Hans Christen with, with 50 years of exploring on the Norwegian continental shelf always went back to, to the, the same areas, looking over and over again and, and showing that there are still potential, even though it's been looked at several, several times and that uh, the last rock has not been, been turned. So, uh, of course, with, with the Schlag Ugle discovery, I also need to mention that, that Konoko Phillips for, for the discovery was uh, uh, was the winner of the Exploration Revival Award in, in 2021. So it shows how, how important it is to, although some people doesn't seem potential, there are still still potential there. And when Hans Christen and his crew made the uh, Avalsnes uh, uh, or Johannes Valdrup discovery, uh, again, you can see the historical production and the prognosis taken from the NPD resource report 2009. And this is uh, from the report where the data was based on. And you can see that in, in 2022, where we are now, uh, you can see that um, it's um, a decline of production from, from the shelf that the prognosed uh, in 2009. So the interest to compare what NPD released uh, two weeks ago in their NPD resource report for, for 2020. And you can actually see that today in 2022, we are not declining right after 2022. We are extended the uh, uh, lifetime of production from the Norwegian shelf with the exploration results. And that's in all scenarios, including and excluding Johan Sverdrup discovery. And you can, can compare to compare to the 2009, and you can see that the curve here in, in all scenarios, as I said, have, have extended. And that's thanks to, to all the discoveries being made on, on the shelf. Like last year, we had discoveries in the Bern Sea, Norwegian Sea, and the North Sea with high exploration activity and uh, making, uh, making discoveries. And there are, of course, different um, sizes of the discoveries, but, but everything is uh, relative to the location. And the good thing is that there are good resource base for future value creation. Uh, we can see that there are resources both in open areas and unopened areas. Most of the volumes are, are in Barren Sea, but of course there are uh, volumes in the Norwegian Sea and North Sea, and, and they are also they are close to infrastructure, making them very, very important uh, barrels. And talking about the two great explorers like uh, Leif Eriksson and, and Hans Christen, we also need to mention Fritjof Nansen, who, who traveled with his ship from uh, to the North Pole. Uh, I'm not going to guess the discoveries he uh, sailed across, but uh, could look like visiting or something. But but anyway, he he um, uh, when when Hans Christen were mapping the Avalsnes prospect of the Johan Sverdrup, he was sitting at this building uh, at Lysaker Brygge outside Oslo. And you can see in, in the canteen there, they are a model of the Fram ship, which Fritz of Nansen used to, to go out in the North Pole. And uh, I can imagine that um, every morning and evening when Hans Christen uh, went to work, uh, he uh, and working on the Avalsnes, he were passing this uh, Fram model thinking about uh, and reminder about going out there and explore for hydrocarbons. And the Fram ship takes us to the first presentation of today and the program. So we will have the first presentation of today about Trun Shirkivik in Equinor and the recent exploration activity in the Greater Fram area. 
that's under the topic underexplored near field. We will have a small coffee break in between before we take lunch at uh, around 12. And then we will go on to the NCS in the world and international analogs to the NCS. We will uh, we have a last uh, minute cancel of a bond presentation, so we will have a 50 minutes break and uh, I urge you to maybe stretch your legs uh, instead of just uh, reading emails and uh, and sitting on chair, but uh, stretch your legs and take maybe a walk outside. We will also have a risking of uh, one of the key, some of the key wells for 2022 uh, by you as the audience, so that will be interesting to see how the community are uh, comparing their uh, chance of success compared to the operator. And then we will end the day with a keynote by Alexi Milko, uh, looking at pre-drill versus uh, post-drill well results from, from exploration in Mexico. And we'll end the day at, at four o'clock. On the day two, we will start at 9.30, and we will have start with a uh, topic of optimization of the subservices new technology. Have a small coffee break, and then go into the future of exploration, and then break for lunch. And uh, after lunch, going into a challenging oils topic with a keynote of Paul Fairman from EGI a small coffee break, and then we will have a quiz uh, about dry wells. So um, it will be a prize for the winner, so um, so be prepared. And we will end the seminar um, on day two with a keynote by Alexi Milko on um, on key failure mode for, for segments, so prospects. And then we will end the day with summary and feedback uh, at four o'clock. So um, to show our gratitude to the um, presenters, we want to give a, a copy of the book uh, about Life Ericsson Adventures, so they could be even more inspired for exploring. And uh, with that, I just want to wish everyone good luck and uh, enjoy the, the seminar. So um, I will now give uh, the word over to Alan, who can uh, introduce the Underexplorer Near Field. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, yeah, as the, the program shows, we will have uh, five uh, presentations during this uh, session, now before lunch, uh, covering both uh, near field exploration and uh, discoveries and, and also uh, underexplored place. Uh, we start with two, uh, <clears throat> two presentations before we take a short uh, coffee break, and then uh, three more, uh, and then before we try to uh, break for lunch at uh, 12. Uh, and if you have any any questions for the presenters, please uh, note them down in the in the chat, and uh, then I will uh, uh, we will go through them uh, according to how much time we have after each of the presentations. So I think then it's time to start with the first uh, presentation. Uh, <clears throat> our first presenter is uh, Trond Kirkevik uh, in Equinor. Uh, and here we give us a talk about the Greater Flam uh, area, as uh, Matthias uh, showed, uh, just showed. Uh, <clears throat> after graduating with the Master of Science in 2008, Trond started working in Equinor, or Stator Hydro as it was then, uh, as a reservoir geophysicist. In uh, 2013, Trond started working in the Exploration Department, and has for the last couple of years had a role as area lead in exploration in the Greater Flam area. So, uh, <clears throat> if you can uh, share your uh, presentation, uh, Dron. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I will share my screen. Yes, there we see it. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm uh, Tron Kirkevik, and I'm going to present the recent exploration activities that we've had in uh, the greater from area. Now, uh, the greater from area is uh, located in the northern North Sea, so roughly 60 kilometers off the west coast, more or less. Um, <clears throat> the structural architecture of the area is dominated by the late Jurassic rifting period. And when we talk about the greater from area, it's not really a well-defined area with with uh, sharp boundaries, but it, as the name suggests, it's an uh, it refers to a larger area around the from field, where <clears throat> we have been a team uh, working up and maturing the area for for some years now. Now, if we, if we look at the larger area around uh, the greater from around the area here, we, we are 
in an area with a long exploration history. So it started with the discovery of the troll field in 79, and then followed by the discovery of the Vega fields and the Vestlerik in the south in the early 80s. <clears throat> and then later in 89, the discovery of the UF field was made and the Trump fields in 90. Um, and after this, several other discoveries have also been made, made uh, in the area. And to this day, the area remains as one of the most prospective areas on the NCS. That's an opinion uh, anyway. <clears throat> um, but we see that the large crustal scale fault blocks, they are drilled, the Troll, the Vestlerik, the Oseberg, and so on. And the uh, prospects located on the narrow rift terraces in, in the area are smaller, but they are many. <clears throat> and with the mindset of clustering, you can build a portfolio of opportunities uh, within a geographically limited area and uh, make value of that and cluster the opportunities. And uh, the recent exploration activity uh, we've had in the area demonstrates that exploration with commitment uh, on a portfolio of opportunities can deliver resources of both significant value and uh, volume. And that's what I'm going to spend the next 15 to 20 minutes to to present the activities we have been uh, ha we've been having in the area lately. So, but first, <clears throat> what have we learned from the previous from the exploration history, the previous exploration activities? Now, on the left hand side here, you can see a seismic line northwest southeast seismic line that's uh, from the CGG relatively new CGG broadband data set um, <clears throat> and we've learned that from the exploration history we we have learned that we have well developed reservoirs across the whole stratigraphy from the very deep to the shallow um, we have also proven that we have working trapping, trap, trapping mechanisms. And uh, one example on this seismic line, you can see the typical rotated uh, Jurassic fault blocks. <clears throat> and we also have stratigraphic traps uh, proven to work in the area. Um, we have a world-class source rock in the Dreupner and Heather formation. And also we have a perfect timing of, of the various prospect elements. We have the deposition of the reservoir first, the trap formation, and finally the hydrocarbons migrating into the traps. Uh, another thing that we have learned was, um, was that um, we have working petroleum systems proven in several places across the whole stratigraphic column. But in the focus area, we've only proven commercial success within the Jurassic pre-rift and sin-rift stratigraphy. And uh, if you look at the later stratigraphic chart to on the left hand side here, that uh, means we have this proven reproduction in the area from the late Jurassic uh, shallow marine sognophyll formation, transphyll formation. We also have production from the deep marine equivalents further uh, west, and we have our Middle Jurassic uh, brand group. So that would be our Tarbert, Ness, at the Rannock, and Oseberg formations. So that is what we have learned. Um, now, going back to 2015 uh, and 2016, uh, Equinor had been an active uh, exploration company in the area for a long time. Uh, but activity had been somewhat reduced for, for a period. But uh, with the oil production of the nearby fields, uh, this area here <clears throat> on decline, um, and available capacity on hosts was increasing, 
exploration was becoming more important. <clears throat> and uh, uh, as a response to this, uh, Equinor made ambitious <clears throat> exploration goals for the area. And our goal was to revitalize the area as a core area for Equinor. And uh, we wanted to achieve this by maturing and develop the existing place, uh, the ones that had proven commercial success. But also we wanted to open up new place for commercial interest. Um, and with the trust and support of our management, uh, at the time this work was done in a bottom up uh, approach. And <clears throat> to achieve these goals, a key enabling factor for us was the investment in the new regional CGG broadband data set. Uh, the data enabled us to work seamless across large areas, uh, develop geological models, and place the opportunities in their regional context. And before this, before these, we had this data working with the area on, on a regional or even semi-regional scale, that could be quite uh, painful, and it involved a lot of patchwork uh, with several surveys. Now, the new seismic data allowed for the development of geological models uh, in a way that we had not been able to do before. And that had uh, implications for the, for us at least, for the Paleocene deep marine systems, for the upper Jurassic, shallow marine to the deep marine turbidite systems, uh, the Brent, the Oseberg formation, and also the, the tidal systems of, of the Cook formation. Now, <clears throat> after some years of maturation, building a portfolio of uh, opportunities. Uh, Equinor's drilling hiatus came to an end in uh, 2018. So it had then been uh, four years since, since the last well was drilled. And since 2018, we haven't really looked back. So since 2018, we've drilled 10 prospects in uh, and 18 well bores in total. So that includes the, the, the side tracks. And the wells we drilled, you can see them on the, or uh, not the wells, but the, the prospects we drilled, you can see them on the uh, right hand figure here with the black dots. <clears throat> so we drilled 10 prospects, and out of these 10 prospects, uh, we made seven discoveries. And uh, you may recognize some of these names. So uh, we made a few discoveries in the late Jurassic deep marine sandstones. Uh, that would be so Nomoria, that was a, a discovery in the late Jurassic deep marine. And that was a Bergen also, Swisher, and also Echinocer. All of those had discoveries in the deep marine upper Jurassic stratigraphy. But Echinocer, that was mainly a Brent. Uh, discovery, though that's where the most of the resources are located. Um, the Blasto discovery made uh, that we drilled last year, uh, that was a discovery in the late Jurassic shallow marine, Sognefjord formation. Uh, and uh, then we have Revanu, which is a middle Jurassic prospect, uh, discovery, middle Jurassic discovery. Uh, and that's also the case for Toppa that was just recently drilled. And uh, yeah, both of them Middle Jurassic. Um, <clears throat> now all of these discoveries were made in, in, the, in, in the established middle to late Jurassic legacy place if, if, uh, of the area, if you like. Now we, due to the proximity to infrastructure, we expect these to contribute with high value. Uh, but we also see that uh, putting all of these together, we see that they do not only contribute with high value, they also add significant resources, high volume. So as they amount to uh, up to 300 million barrels of oil equivalents. Um, so now what? 
uh, we have our discoveries. Uh, they uh, are spread across several licenses with the uh, varying partnership configurations. Um, how can we realize the value of, of the discoveries? And do we have all the needed pieces to, to overcome that critical threshold to start clustering, designing the, the area solutions? Now, fortunately, we are uh, in a situation here that we have several tieback options available. Uh, and uh, on this map on the right hand side, you can see how the the, the layout of the uh, infrastructure is. So we have the Troll B platform here, Troll C, and then we have the layout of template templates around. And that's also, you can also see the layout in the from area and also you and, and, and the Vega fields. <clears throat> so that gives us optionality when it comes to evacuating the, the, these resources. Now for the discoveries within the from license, uh, we uh, that would that means Akina Sur and Blast and also uh, F West and another uh, another discovery. Those will be tied back to Troll C via the from system. Now, for the area outside of the from licenses, we are evaluating several options. And possible hosts include Troll B, which may have the option for full electrification. And then we have Troll C, but also Troll C via the from system. And then also if, if a northern route is will be evaluated, then we also have the UI infrastructure up north here. In any case, Equinor's main priority is to maximize the value by a timely development and an appropriate area solution and exploit the synergies you, you can get by having uh, several discoveries in uh, a geographically close a limited area. But to achieve this, collaboration between the licenses are key. Now, so what you've seen so far uh, is a snapshot a snapshot of the situation as it looks today. Now, uh, Equinor have plans to continue the high level of activity in the years to come. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to uh, develop the area not only by targeting the, the uh, established place, but also open up new place. And um, we've, we've made some attempts at that. Uh, but we have not had any success with that yet. But we're not giving up on that. The next well, Kvaitsche and Roll. Don't look for a deeper meaning on the prospect name. Uh, but uh, that's uh, a well that will be drilled in the 293B license. Um, scheduled for drilling in uh, Q1, Q2 of this year. That's going to be a really exciting well. It has a main, the main target in the Paleocene, but also targets in Eocene and, and late Cretaceous. So that's going to be uh, a, a really exciting well this year. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, enabling uh, factors for uh, achieving these kinds of results that we've uh, that under the premise that we can agree that Equinor, together with our partners, have had some exploration success in the recent years in the area. So uh, now I've categorized them in three uh, parts here. So the first uh, enabling factor, the geological elements. So which, of course, it's not something that we should underestimate. The, the luxury of uh, having our world-class source rock being in an area with well-developed reservoirs, uh, an abundance of traps, and also ideal timing of the various prospect elements. Uh, that should not be underestimated, of course. Uh, on the data and the digital side of things, um, 
another key enabling factor for us has been the uh, having that new broad regional broadband seismic data available and just availability of data in general uh, has been uh, really important to to develop the geological understanding of, of the area um, and of course uh, having the best tools to do our at our disposal to do to do our job is of course really really important uh, and these two categories of course lay the foundation for successful exploration but the geology uh, is what it is uh, and the data and the tools they allow us to apply our geological understanding and develop models and concepts that hopefully gives us a uh, representation of the subsurface and allows us to make predictions now these are important but someone has to do the job and i would like to emphasize the importance of the uh human uh importance of the human factors uh, or that has at least been very important for for us and uh teamwork the importance of teamwork a group sharing a common goal um composition of the team people having people with the right competence and clearly defined roles and responsibilities um team stability uh, which is of course important for the working environment uh, for building the area knowledge uh, but also to take advantage of the feedback loops you get when you make a prediction you drill a well and you can feed that information back into developing your uh subsurface understanding even further collaboration within the team within the company uh, and also externally with partners that has been extremely important for us now we don't always agree with our, our partners of course but we have um most of the time been able to find some common ground that we can uh, so that we can still make progress and uh, and um, manage everyone's uh, uh, objectives um, and also we've had a supportive management which i believe is really important especially with when working with this kind of bottom-up approach uh, the trust and, and support from from our management has been extremely important yeah and uh, with these factors in place uh, i believe you have the elements to make a well-oiled machinery that can deliver uh, uh, good exploration results um yeah and uh, to summarize exploration on an area portfolio like we have done in the greater from area is a marathon uh, not a sprint uh, short-term setbacks they do happen so we drill dry wells from time to time um, but stay firm um, this delivery has many contributors it's been a team effort within Equinor but also with our partners in various licenses and uh, on behalf of Equinor I'd like to thank some of you are probably out there so you know who you are and uh, thanks to all of the par our partners for the collaboration so far and we are looking forward to the continuation yeah thank you uh, thank you very much Tron. a very very nice uh, presentation uh, <clears throat> uh let's see i don't see any uh, yeah here one uh, question in the chat uh, yeah. are the discoveries filled uh, to spill and are they over pressured or varied degree of over pressure between the prospects any hints to share on this uh, it, it we have uh, all, all of them really we have uh, over pressure and we have hydrostatic and uh, yeah. yeah so it's yeah yeah <clears throat> Uh, uh, yeah, there's no more questions there. Uh, 
see, but I uh, have one. <coughs> I see there's uh, definitely a lot of charge uh, coming in the, uh, into this area. A uh, lot of uh, lots of uh, oil. Do you see signs of different uh, uh, charges, or is it uh, mostly from one uh, one uh, migration? Um, we see uh, uh, several types of migration. We see short distance uh, migration through probably through juxtaposition with mature source rock. And also we see uh, uh, long distance uh, migration. Um, and also we see that we have contributions from the Dirkna and the Heather formation. Uh, so it's uh, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, since there's no more question, I thank you very much, Tron, for uh, thank for, you uh, for sending this for us.